I must say, it's always exciting to see the attendee list grow. It's like seeing them walk in the door of the lecture hall and find a seat back in the good old days. Um, so I think we are going to get started now. Uh, as mentioned again, my name is Mark Hillmeyer. I'm a faculty member in chemistry at the University of Minnesota, and I'm also the director of the NSF Center for Sustainable Polymers. Uh, you are at the uh, end of our uh, annual meeting. We've had now 12 uh, annual meetings uh, support uh, uh, representing the center over the years. And um, at, it has uh, been custom over the last many years to have a, a Covestro lecture in sustainability. And I'm very happy to host Professor Jenna Jombach uh, today's uh, Covestro lecture in sustainability. Uh, we're really hosting this public lecture in partnership with Covestro, which has been a really longtime supporter and sponsor of this, uh, of this public event. And I wanna thank them uh, for all their support over the years. It's been very important to keep this lectureship uh, going. Uh, professor uh, Jombach is the Georgia Athletic Association Distinguished Professor in Environmental Engineering in the College of Engineering at the University of Georgia the director of the Center for Circular Materials Management within the New Materials Institute, headquartered at the University of Georgia. Uh, she is a National Geographic Fellow, uh, conducting research on solid waste issues for more than two dozen years and specializing in global waste management issues and plastic contamination. Uh, in 2014, she sailed across the Atlantic Ocean with 13 other women, women in X expedition uh, to sample ocean plastic and encourage women to enter into STEM uh, disciplines. And she's also the co-developer of a mobile uh, app called Marine Debris Tracker. This is a tool to facilitate global citizen science. The app and citizen science program has documented the location of over 3 million litter and marine debris items removed uh, from the environment. I was very happy to visit the University of Georgia recently and meet a Jenna in person whose work I know uh, very well. And uh, Jenna, uh, thank you so much for taking the time to deliver this public lecture. And we're very much looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Welcome. Thanks so much, Mark. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here and uh, an honor as well. Um, so yeah, and I'm actually in Minnesota. I'm not in Georgia right now. Um, I'm currently on expedition. I'm on the banks of the Mississippi River uh, in Champlin, Minnesota. And this is a picture of the Mississippi in the heart of the Twin Cities, which is where I went yesterday. And so anyway, I know we have, we, I know we have to virtually gather, um, but it's great to be here in my home state. So I grew up um, on the banks of the Snake River in Pine City, Minnesota. So, um, but I've really had the honor um, of traveling the world, I guess you, you heard Mark in my in introduction talk about uh, crossing the ocean with 13 other women. That's a top middle picture, um, something I never thought I'd do. My roots are in environmental engineering and I do my work on land primarily, um, but I had this opportunity and it was um, one of the hardest things I had ever done, but incredibly impactful to see the impact of what we do on land to our ocean as we were sampling um, microplastic in the ocean. And even before leaving, seeing uh, wave after wave with a confetti full of microplastic washing up on the shores of the Canary Islands. Um, I also have to say, I've traveled uh, a lot with the US State Department. So I'm an international informational speaker um, in their public diplomacy office. And that's taken me to 13 different uh, countries around the world and being able to see how we manage our waste, um, you know, on the, on the front lines really of the plastic pollution issue and the waste management issue globally um, has been incredible and been able to um, just really enrich the work that I do, the science that I do, but really seeing um, and you'll, you'll see later when I, when I talk more about that. And right now, so in this bottom corner, you can see that's my husband and my kids and I had a landfill. My husband and I met at that landfill. So let's just say that the work that I do is, is kind of all in the family. And I will talk later about this has been my life for the last three weeks. Uh, we are living out of this 19 foot camper and uh, we've been traveling the entire length of the Mississippi River. We left Athens on April 3rd. Um, <clears throat> the official work associated with this project started in, in Baton Rouge the, the weekend after that, so around April 8th. 
Um, but this has basically been our life for, for three weeks. Um, luckily, I found a house to, to be in now that I'm here with family uh, for this lecture. So let's, why are, we, why are we talking about plastic? I'm gonna talk a lot about the research that we've published. I'm gonna to touch on it. I know probably those of you working in this space are familiar with some of this, but um, this is research that we published in 2017 when we were just trying to see how much plastic um, as a material that we use has been produced globally. And this is 8.3 billion metric tons. Um, and that's a cumulative number. Um, from a very small amount, right, in 1950. And I mean, plastic is so incredibly useful. Any color of the rainbow, it can be soft, it can be hard, it can be a film. I mean, we know why we use it so extensively. Um, but a lot of it is used for single use items uh, in ways that gets put into the waste stream relatively quickly. And so that meant by 2015, 6.3 billion metric tons of plastic had already become waste. And then we looked at the, in this global materials flow, what had we done with that waste? Well, on average around the globe, we have only recycled 9% um, of that. And actually what makes it so useful uh, is what makes it so hard to manage on this back end because there's such a variety of ways it can be used and so many additives and so many applications uh, from a, a, an economy of scale standpoint, it actually makes it very hard to recycle when it's so heterogeneous. Um, oops, sorry, clicked off for a second. So um, this graphic, which I like, so part of it is our research that we published in 2015, which publishing this research sort of literally changed my life. Um, and this is a mashup though of that data set, which is the blue colors on the land, the global estimate of plastic entry in the ocean, which at this time uh, was 8 million metric tons. That's now increased to about 11 million metric tons, um, equal to about a dump truck of plastic going into the ocean every minute. Uh, the pink circles are the samples of microplastic that have been taken floating on the ocean surface. And those have been uh, extrapolated to quantities really only about 3% of what we estimate going into the ocean every year. Um, and that sort of begs this question, where, where is this missing plastic and, and where has it been going if it's, if it's entering our oceans and our environment? Um, but we have now found it, uh, colleagues of mine at the top of Mount Everest and then you know, at the very depths of our ocean in the Mariana Trench. Um, these yellow are the riverine inputs that have been estimated by other researchers. And so looking at the rivers as conduits for plastic uh, from land to, to reach the ocean is important, but we also know that, um, uh, you know, they're sort of, some of it gets deposited there. So within the rivers themselves, uh, we find plastic. It doesn't all necessarily reach the ocean. I also wanted to touch on this research that we um, published in 2018 as a follow-up to the 2015 uh, research. People were asking, well, we know that a lot of plastic scrap is being exported and we couldn't take that into account for that research. So we specifically looked at that. Um, and my PhD uh, student right now really dug into 28 years of UN com trade data, the imports and exports. And we found that, um, for various, you know, various reasons, uh, the the World Trade Organization um, was really encouraging global trade, and we in the U.S. switched to single stream, so it's very convenient for you. You get to put all your recyclables in one bin, but it's actually really a little bit harder on the back end to design those material recovery facilities to have clean enough materials that don't need a secondary sort. But over fifty percent of our recyclables were going to China. Um, of course, as a manufacturing hub, they wanted the raw materials um, and it was less expensive actually for management and sorting over there, um, but they closed their doors to this. So at the beginning of 2018, this was no longer possible, which ended up um, sort of a cascade economic and logistical impact to our recycling here in the US. And this really hit us at our own kitchen table. Many people's um, communities couldn't recycle the same items um, and really had, there was just a, a, an economic impact from this. And we really kind of started to look at how is our recycling system designed and how can we think about um, designing our packaging so it can be domestically recycled. And that led to another work which was published um, just last year 
in science, looking at specifically at the US. So part of what we also said is, you know, that global number had a lot of country data that we needed to be transparent about in terms of building that model. But in order to really understand each country, we encouraged everyone to sort of dig into their own data. And the other thing that it encourages people to collect better data. Um, but we published this work showing that the US is not just um, number one in per capita plastic waste generation, but also number one as a country gener generating plastic waste and looking at new numbers of illegal dumping and taking into account our export of materials, um, we ranked much higher in terms of mismanaged plastic, um, potentially reaching the ocean and, and in the environment. Um, so, you know, that's data to kind of motivate change and, um, but what we, and it, and it has, I mean, to be honest, in 2001, when I first started working on this, or first wanted to work on this issue, I was A, told that nobody cared about it and, you know, don't, don't bother, especially as an environmental engineer working on land. Um, but after we published the paper in 2015 and other research by uh, other folks, I think there's been a lot of action taken. Um, but even with that action taken, when we looked at sort of a, uh, a future scenario, uh, similar to a wedges approach for climate, seeing that those actions won't even get us below that 8 million metric tons. So current actions, you know, meant that 20 to 53 megatons or million metric tons of plastic would still enter our environment by 2030 if we didn't get more aggressive with what we're doing, either reducing waste we generate, increasing waste management, and then um, cleanup and recovery as well. And this was actually one of two parallel studies published in this science issue. The other was conducted by Pew and Systemic, and both of those studies disconnected from each other came to these same conclusions that we needed to be more aggressive. So this is something that I came up with um, when I was first asked to testify in 2016. And thinking about um, the 2015 results and sort of as we built that model, it was like, how much plastic waste is generated, how, how much, it, well, how much waste is generated, how much of this is plastic, how much is mismanaged, how much is near the coastline. It made me think about this framework and coming up with a way to reduce the quantity. If we want a zero input goal into the ocean, where can we intervene sort of along this whole value chain and what can we do? And I think looking at this framework, um, is sort of a broad way to say, you know, how far upstream can we intervene? Can, you know, we reduce the quantity we're, gener we're producing or uses or make changes? Can we look at different materials? How do we improve our waste management system? Can we capture it before it gets in? And there's a whole bunch of ways to do that underneath um, each one of these locations in the framework. And then finally, if you are just capturing it, can we collect data to inform more upstream changes? And so these are just some of the specifics um, for sort of each one of those categories. But in terms of, you know, reducing demand using reusable items, which of course are not possible everywhere in the world, um, and making it easy for people to do that. So refill stations um, by major brands, RFID technology, how can you get products to people without producing waste in the first place. Um, and if packaging is needed, how can we design it um, to take out some of that variability and make sure that the materials are um, non-toxic and easily recyclable. And then of course, looking at new materials, this is my colleague, Jason Lachlan, who Mark knows well at the New Materials Institute. Certainly that's gonna be a part of what I would say, this is an integrated approach to this issue. Um, increasing management uh, globally and uh, just creating, you know, more robust waste management systems to actually capture this material when it's put into the waste stream. And then finally, if you do clean up, collecting data on that to then inform some of this upstream work. So um, I kind of mentioned that that frontline uh, work with the State Department in terms of actually being able to see what's going on. But what I'm really excited about is instead of these global models, I'm now doing more community based work. And it was really motivated both by looking at um, the data from some of our work informing things like G7 and G20 declarations and having these global 
conversations and a lot of people talking about the circular economy being a solution to this issue. Um, and then working with the State Department, meeting people on the ground in their communities, and they would say, okay, great, Jenna, now we know this is an issue, but what should we do about it? And I would say, you are the expert of your community. I mean, let's look around and kind of see what's going on. And then I, you know, you should be empowered by this data to decide what you want to do. And that's where this circularity assessment protocol um, was born. And it's really sort of this holistic picture of looking at the, the flow, uh, but it's a bit more than a materials flow. It's not exactly that, but how plastic is incoming and used in various packaging in a community, what com the community sort of awareness and um, attitudes are towards the material looking at are there other materials um, available or how are materials and products used within the community? Are there reuse options? And that might be everything from a glass bottle to you know, the new company El Grama, which is like an ice cream truck for uh, filling soap bottles um, that comes through the community. And then we looked at sort of this end of cycle, both separating waste management collection and then sort of this um, the end of cycle, which we're calling it. So that would be, you know, whether it's recycled or landfilled, um, because both of those are sort of these two critical steps. And then finally, a leakage component. Um, and so I'm going to talk about, so this, we created this in, well, first presented it in 2018 at the um, Marine Debris Conference in San Diego, the International Marine Debris Conference, and then sort of had, we're ramping up and all of a sudden we're going to be working in 26 cities and 10 countries and then the pandemic came. Um, and I have to say what happened was incredible in that we didn't completely stop this work. Of course, we completely stopped traveling. Um, but where it was safe, we worked with local implementation partners. So we started training virtually uh, local partners in these communities to collect the data needed for this. And I think it made the results even more meaningful um, and, and really has just you know, empowered those cities and, and partners that we've been working with there. So mission here is uh, information sharing amongst communities. I think you know, everybody's working to address the waste management or plastic pollution issue, but at the same time, there's so many context sensitive differences, right? So I think, you know, even here in the US, what might be recyclable somewhere else is not in another community. And so that's really important. And then providing data. Um, and, you know, I'm a researcher. So, you know, getting this data and, and looking at data is really what I do, but figuring out how that data can be used by communities, how they can be empowered by it to look in, uh, and use it in a way that they can decide what to do. So one application of this cap was with National Geographic on this Sea to Source Ganges expedition. What was so amazing about this, we had a really big team, interdisciplinary, their first women-led expedition team. Um, we were in both Bangladesh and India. We had local scientists from both of those countries that really led in their countries and then uh, other scientists from three other countries. And it was just an incredible uh, research uh, expedition. And so here's the map of where we went along the main stem of the Ganges from uh, Bola in Bangladesh, uh, two other communities there, Chanpur and Rajbari, and then into seven and, or eight other communities within India along, along the main stem of the river over 2,000 kilometers, and we did it twice. Uh, this is all in 2019. We did a pre-monsoon expedition and we did a post-monsoon expedition. So here's some behind the scene photos of this. This is the boat that we lived on in Bangladesh. I have to tell you in May, uh, late May and, and, and June is when that expedition happened. It was extremely hot um, and actually really challenging health-wise to work in those situations. Everyone, at least um, a lot of people of us and on the land team had to get up very early to get out to be able to just have it in safe working conditions with the heat. Um, one reason, you know, for doing some of this work is there really hadn't been a lot of data collected. And so our collaborator um, and partner from Bangladesh really did a literature review of just microplastic within the Ganges River and in Bangladesh, and there hadn't been a lot of, of research done. And so that was um, really good motivation. So microplastic, uh, surface water, um, sediment, 
and air were all sampled and I'll show some pictures. So the water sampling has already been published. So Imogen Knapper um, out of the University of Plymouth led this work and found that up to one to three billion microplastics per day could be discharged into the Bay of Bengal from the Ganges River. And this is the air sampling. This hasn't been published yet. And also conversations about um, the, with the fishermen and with the fish that are being used there and how they might be impacted. But this actually really led to um, more conversations with the fishermen about fishing gear. And so there was a systematic survey done of, of gear that was ending up deposited on the, on the shoreline and then looking at that as a material for recycling. So um, our collaborators, uh, Heather Coldaway from the Zoological Society of London has worked before with the Philippines to collect and recycle fishing gear there into carpets actually made in Georgia. So um, that's a cool connection. And so looking at potentially exploring, you know, this was not research to just for research sake, it was really to engage again the communities and, and talk about potential interventions and solutions. You can see from this picture on the right of the screen though, that they're not just catching fish, this net and heat and this fisherman said this often happens is just full of plastic as well. So on land, we were doing our circularity assessment protocol, which means we're uh, documenting what it, packaging is available in the shops. We're looking at alternative materials. We're documenting um, the leakage and plastic waste mismanaged and managed on land. Um, we also found that um, expense and, and alternatives um, and really time constraints, financial and time constraints are major drivers for single use plastic for women. And I think, you know, we know why this is happening there, but I think for us similarly, even in the US, the time constraint and, and convenience we often talk about, you know, using it for those reasons. Um, some cool technology that I'm gonna elaborate more on in a minute was this bottle tag technology. So we put GPS sensors in these bottles that traveled down the river to see how plastic would travel down the river if it makes it in. And um, this was published just last year as well. And then in terms of our data collection as researchers, we used our open data uh, marine debris tracker mobile app which is now sponsored by Morgan Stanley, which means we've been able to improve it extensively and have partnership with National Geographic, which has been really, really helpful. And, um, and this is a citizen science based app or it can be used for citizen science, but we used it um, as researchers and that was um, a tremendous opportunity to collect data, but also make it available. So the data sort of uh, not owned by, I mean, it's owned by everyone and not owned by anyone in the sense that anyone can access, uh, have access to it. So um, walking and walking through many cities and collecting this data along with our partners. Um, as I mentioned, the data is open and anyone can have access to it here. DebrisTracker.org is the website. And um, again, I'm gonna talk about this from a local standpoint in just a minute. This, you can see the data collected. So, um, this is our route of the expedition. And um, there was over 89,000 uh, litter I or data on litter items collected there. And I think thinking of this, um, you know, again, how does this data actually form um, or, you know, form into the decision-making process? So as you look at an item, it's really important. We, it's not just like, oh, this is a plastic item and this isn't, or this is metal, or it's really, what is this item? What is it sort of exactly? And then, how do we think it got here? Um, what are the influencing factors around? So we're mapping many other things at the same time. And then what can we, and um, that we is, you know, what can that community, you know, if they want to, if this is an issue of why, of this item being here, what can they do about it? What can we do about it? Um, so also as a part of this work, we um, had held community workshops. So on both sides of it, even pre-monsoon, um, we had World Cafe workshops where um, those are really cool because you you start with questions at one table and have to pass your thoughts on to the next table and they have to add to them. And so it makes you put yourself in other people's shoes. Um, we held trainings for Marine Debris Tracker. Um, we also uh, created curriculum for schools. So on the post-monsoon expedition, we went into schools and did training with the tracker, but also had a um, 
plastic activity journal for people to just become aware. And to be honest, plastic has entered the waste stream in places like India and Bangladesh very quickly. Um, and the infrastructure was not there to manage it. And even in some cases, people don't realize that plastic isn't like other materials. Um, you know, many regular ways of managing things like, you know, as they prep vegetable scraps. So my colleague there, um, one of our partners on it, who I went to grad school with and is a professor at IAT there now, said, you know, my grandma would just take the vegetable scraps out to the backyard and bury them, you know, similar in terms of composting. And I think in some cases, I would see a lot of plastic um, packaging just put with food waste as well. And um, the awareness of, of that being a different material isn't in every situation and community. So um, if you're interested in the results of this work, uh, there is a summary uh, report and it's on my website, um, which is here at the university um, on our C to source page. So there's both a summary report but the other really cool thing about this work is we made a methods toolkit. It's a really long document, but there's a decision matrix at the front um, to sort of decide what method might work for you. Um, there's some guiding questions, um, but then there's 167 pages of all the different methods that we used that we have, we felt like we could um, publish in the sense that they were validated through science and publication and things like that. So. They're open methods for anyone else to apply um, in whatever situation they feel is appropriate. So I highly recommend that document if you're interested in trying to do similar work. So what I want to talk about now, um, the last one of my projects I want to touch on is this Mississippi River Plastic Pollution Initiative. This is why I've been in the field for three weeks. Um, this, is, this is why I'm in Minnesota right now. We're, we're at the tail end of this expedition, but this is the mayors along the Mississippi River. The group is the Mississippi River City and Towns Initiative, and it's 100 mayors who are in this um, group together and they work together on issues related to the entire river. They partnered with the UN Environment Program North America office and uh, made a commitment in uh, 2018 to reduce the plastic in the Mississippi by 20% by 2020. And they got a lot of commitments to kind of do that, but really didn't have a baseline to um, measure up against. And so they came to us and National Geographic and said, how can we collect this data? We don't have, you know, we don't have a big budget. We don't have a, you know, we can't do a sea to source expedition. And, and even in the pandemic things, you know, we're, we're looking different, but, um, we talked about they well they came to us and said we want to do uh, a citizen science a community based data collection approach and we said great um you know we have a tool for that with debris tracker and also we have methods that we feel like we developed um for seed to source that we could modify and apply here so all of these partners have been working together for a long time over over a year now um we've been discussing and, and planning this and it's so it started April 1st, um, and it's going until April 25th. And what I want to show here is, as I said, well, I didn't really get to explain our transect method, but our, um, our method for collecting data within the sea to source Ganges expedition and all circularity assessment protocols is a random stratified sampling strategy um, where we do transects. And um, we do those based upon population density and some things. So we wanted to spread citizen scientists out. You didn't want to say, okay, just go, somebody go out over this three week time and, and collect some data, you know, some litter data. You need to give enough direction that people have somewhere to go and something to do um, that is going to help the science, but yet also flexible enough that they are not required on a certain day or to go to a certain place. Because again, um, you know, we just had to be as flexible as possible. So we tried to find that happy medium. This is a pilot project. So, so we'll see, you know, how it all comes out. But this is a map of where we were directing people to go. So these tiny um, orange looking squares are where people can start a transect. So we gave them a lot of, you know, leeway, a lot of ideas on here's where you can go. Here's where you can start a transect. Please just walk for 30 minutes and collect data on the litter. It's up to you if you feel comfortable enough to pick up that 
litter, please do so. Um, but most importantly, we need this transect and litter data. And then what we did is we got enough data for each square and by enough that would be um, multiple transects within that area, we would turn those squares blue so that people wouldn't keep going to that and we would spread out the data collection. So that was our strategy as the scientists sort of behind the scenes. Mostly people just were like, okay, we know where we should go and start walking for 30 minutes. So you all are the first people to see these results. Well, not necessarily because it's open data. Anyone can go to debridrecker.org and see this, but the first time I'm presenting them because we're still in the middle. So here is the data collection. There was three pilot cities where data collection was absolutely targeted with outreach. We did four webinar trainings. Um, and so that was Baton Rouge, St. Louis, and St. Paul, Minnesota. And so in between though, we've of course had, had folks also collecting data in other cities and welcome data collected anywhere in the Mississippi River Basin for this project. And of course, debris trackers use globally. Um, and there, this month there's data being collected all over the world. Um, so anyway, and in between, as I said, we've been traveling the whole STEM, our camper, we've been collecting data um, as a part of this work. So just a quick uh, zoom in, this is Baton Rouge where people of course, it nicely spread out collecting the data. There's a, a nice uh, snippet of a transect where you can see um, data is available. Here's St. Louis, um, somebody did a, a, a nice linear square around this park, around those streets. And really we, although people have done, you know, been doing river cleanups for a long time and focusing on the river, we, we kind of really want to collect data in the urban system itself, right? That's where this material is being generated um, and where leakage is, is happening. So it was less about aggregation areas and environmental sinks as about sort of um, in, the, in, in the urban environment of, of where, and this is a snapshot of St. Paul, and we actually need more data collection there. So I'll talk about that in a minute. So we have over 39,000 uh, debris items and we're not done yet, right? There's a few days left. And so um, I would say this, is, this has been a success in terms of that data collection. About 77% of that has been plastic in terms of the characterization within these categories. And then our top items, um, we're consistently seeing cigarette butts, beverage bottles, food wrappers, lots of plastic fragments, and interestingly enough, um, aluminum cans uh, are in that top. Um, the other CETA source work that we were able to also apply here is our bottle tracking technology. And I have to say this has been getting a lot more attention than I, I maybe I realized it would and in, in, in India and Bangladesh, it did not. But um, when the cameras come out at these launch events that are planned by our partners with, with their media partners, um, they've constantly been um, of interest. And so we were able to, we, and, and actually we had some technical difficulties um, within Baton Rouge, we couldn't get the bottles to talk to the satellite. So the GPS sensors worked, they were actually collecting data, but we couldn't get them to transmit through the satellite system so that we, we're told what the data is. So the bottles sort of weren't talking. Um, and I have to say, we we ended up building uh, one of our own that was sort of different, that was that was different than our supplier. And we're able to get that in, in the same location where we launched the one that, that our supplier gave us. And, um, and that was amazing. So why didn't we do this in the first place? Well, because I had already, you know, worked on those uh, worked with those other partners, but um, this was really interesting. So this bottle traveled all the way from north of St. Louis through St. Louis under four bridges. Um, but one thing was really interesting is that, and, and this data then can be used to build transport models, right? So it got stuck when we dropped it off. We didn't have a boat to take it out. The other one was taken out with a boat into the middle of the current. We didn't. So this was so I, I had family with, and they were like, well, that's a little bit more realistic to have it go in on the, on the shore. It, it, it grounded right away. Um, and we actually went and physically collected it because it was like right away grounded and put it back in and were able to throw it in about 40 feet. And then it did, um, it got caught up on some sticks is what it looked like here. And it, it went around and around and, and I, and we have folks on call, we have partners in every state where if it's stuck, we can go grab it, you know, notify course what it's doing and then we can go put it in if we want to collect more data 
So we were about to go gather this one and the guy was really literally driving there. And he said, I said, oh, great, thanks. It's unstuck. He's like, I didn't get there yet. So it actually spontaneously got unstuck here and traveled all the way through the city until this area, um, which is heavy, heavy barge traffic. So it sat for two days on a barge system here, dislodged again. This means it's moving. This means it ended up stopping on that barge for a while and then moved again. And then it's is currently, well, or has been, this is about 48 hours delayed. I keep it 48 hours delayed. I don't want people looking for these. Um, stopped on a barge in that area. So really interesting data there. All right, I'm almost done wrapping up now. I just wanted to circle back to this framework and think about how this data that we're collecting in collaboration with communities can help them sort of inform what kind of action they want to take and stress again that this is really an integrated approach. It's not a, you know, we need to do this and not that. It's really more of a yes and, you know, approach to be able to um, reduce the plastic entering our environment and subsequently our ocean. And um, for a couple uh, media moments, I guess, that have been happening here, there might be some local coverage. Um, I'll be uh, at, a, at a public event with the mayor of St. Paul, Mayor Carter on Saturday. Um, so you may see, see some local news, but just last night on PBS NewsHour, I was on a segment with, a, with some other great folks working on this issue. Um, so go ahead and look up the PBS NewsHour segment and um, and then I was live on the Weather Channel yesterday. I don't know how you can get to that, but the Weather Channel is doing a, a more uh, in-depth segment of the bottle tags uh, either this weekend or next Monday. So you can be sort of on the lookout for that. And if you want to help, here's what you can do. There's a map, um, a live map of St. Paul. And actually, I, I forgot this link, um, but I'll, we can put this link in the chat maybe and you can go to one of the sites because actually we have the least number of blue squares here in St. Paul being the last city. So if you would like to go out and do 30 minutes of tracking with Debris Tracker, you can help with this bigger project, help with the global issue um, and make a difference there. So thank you so much. If you wanna hear more about my family my expedition family adventures, you can go to my blog on my website. And then of course, um, oops, I didn't get that. The Mississippi River work is just unep.org slash Mississippi. So you'll find it all with Google. Everyone's good at that. So thanks, Mark. I think I hit it uh, hopefully almost spot on at 40. That's what our goal was. Yeah, you have 49 seconds. Did you want to say anything? <laughs> That's as good as it gets. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor John Back. I, I just want to say for myself, it's, it's really quite inspirational to see the dedication and all the work that you've done to really help us understand better this, the, this problem. And I really do love all of the citizen science aspects of it are really important for more than one reason, not only the problem at hand, but getting people engaged in the scientific enterprise in general. Yeah. So thank you, thank you so much. That was really a, a lovely lecture. Um, questions have been coming in. I've got a, a bunch of them um, and they're varied. And I will tell all the attendees, to please, if you'd like to use the Q&A function in Zoom to add your question, please do so. And I'm going to take about the next 20 minutes here, and we're going to try to get through as many of these as we can. And I think I'm going to do them actually uh, in order that they came in, but I might skip around depending on the ones I've seen that are that are relevant. Sure. Last whatever, thing I'll say. Whatever works for you, whatever. Well, yeah, okay. whatever you all prefer. And the last thing I'll say is that Jennifer McCambridge uh, uh, from the center has been putting in links in the chat. So a lot of the things you mentioned have now been available to the attendees. Perfect. So I just dropped the, the St. Paul map in there too. So. Oh, great. Thank you Thanks. so much. Thank you so much for doing that. So this came in uh, early uh, in your presentation um, about the yellow marks on a map about, you know, uh, river uh, waste coming in. Uh, and there was no yellow mark uh, from the mouth of the Mississippi, uh, somebody uh, noticed. Um, is that correct? And uh, are we doing something different uh, uh, compared to other rivers in the world that we that people can learn from? Oh, right. So I think, um, oh, on the on the National Geographic yeah, mock-up, right, early yeah, on, right. it's because the quantity estimated there um, is less. And I have to tell you, those yellow marks used the model that we had developed in 2015 as the mismanaged waste scenario. So honestly, the U.S., um, what we were the only country in the top 20, um, and it's primarily because our infrastructure is considered to be 
robust. Well, we know that that's not necessarily the case, but, and that's why we did that 2020 paper. So if you maybe redid this mm. with our 2020 data, those right. riverine inputs might be different. And actually our Mississippi River data collection now I think is really gonna feed that model again. So I would say it's potentially dated, but at the same time, you know, we do have a management, you know, everyone basically has access to a trash can in much of the area of Indian Bangladesh. There just isn't a waste management system. They are, right. we saw people literally putting their trash in the river. That's the historic way of managing waste. It takes it away. And before plastic, you know, it, that, that had very different implications sure. and now it had, it's very different. That's related to the very next question is how does all the okay. plastic get in the ocean? Yeah. <laughs> uh, are, and the question, are companies dumping it there? I hope the answer to that is no, but I can't rule that out on the basis of what you just said. Right. And, and why doesn't it go to the landfill? This is a general yeah. question, but uh, attendees are interested. No, I think it's important. Yeah. So I think uh, uh, what what we have, and I, I did have a different infographic I probably should have used, showed sort of that model in terms of as I said, the quantity of waste we generate, the quantity of that's that plastic, and then the quantity that we call mismanaged. And that mismanaged waste is either inadequately managed, and that's from places that don't have the infrastructure. So as I just said, how does it get in, in places that don't have the infrastructure? It's either they have an open dumping sort of pit in their community, um, and it washes or is blown in, or they're literally using the riverway as a waste management system. Um, without the knowledge of the implications of that. And then I think the, um, the other that we think about for us is litter. So inadequate plus litter. Litter um, is just what ends up sort of leaking out of the system. Some of it's on purpose. In our, in our world, people throw stuff out the window all the time. Um, and then, you know, at, you're sitting on a park bench having a snack and the, something blows away. Um, that's inadvertent. So yeah, all of those ways. And then once it's on land, then it is either blown or washed that even through stormwater systems, stormwater overflow, it gets to our water bodies and then can travel into our water bodies. Of course, if you're close to the coast, so our original model was only 50 kilometers of the coast, we took waste that ended up on land there that might make it realistically might make it to the ocean. Um, so there's, it's a very complex, it's, a, it's right. a simple question, but, but it's kind of a complex answer. And all this work that we're doing in, is going to better inform that we have estimates and models that we built, but we really want this empirical data. So especially these GPS sensors, I want to eventually be able to put some of those on land and ask that question, how much, you know, how much right. of what we see here on near, you know, within two miles of the Mississippi River in St. Paul is actually going to get to the river. Yeah. I, if I saw one of the GPS sensors on land, I'm afraid I have to pick it up and check it out. I would, I, yeah, I would do not touch. Don't worry. It's going to be, it's going to be disguised. We okay. Disguised. Disguise. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, this is an interesting question that came in early uh, regarding collecting data. If the general public goes out to a litter cleanup event, is there somewhere we can share the data? I think you answered that in your talk. Yes. That was great. 100%. <laughs> if you use debris tracker um, and yes, so absolutely. It's completely open and shared and free and there's no cost. And, so and it's, it's you, you have can access your data and everyone else can. So you help this global picture and then you have a way to have your data in a spreadsheet. You know, you have your stats, you have your own pie charts and all of that. Yep. Yes. Um, now we're going to get a couple questions about um, kind of plastic waste response management responsibility. Yep. So um, there's a lot of responsibility for plastic waste management on the consumer. I mean, we are mm -hmm. ultimately ones who put it somewhere. Do you yeah. think there's an imbalance regarding where the responsibility falls? Do you think there should be more responsibility placed on how industry uses plastic in the first place? Kind of what's your thought generally uh, there? Sure. And I'm just going to combine it with the next question uh, yeah. fortuitously is what are yeah. your thoughts on the alliance to end plastic waste, which I guess is another, you know, uh, uh, mission. People will say, okay, we're going to end plastic waste, but on whose responsibility does that fall? Right. Okay. So absolutely, um, a lot, not only the consumer, but the communities. That's why I want to empower these communities with data. The burden, and I see this as an environmental engineer, the communities, all of a sudden, all these materials and all this packaging is here and they have to manage this waste. That's been really, really a challenge. And so um, I think that has led to where things don't have value and um, and we know that if things have value, they don't tend to end up, you know, in the environment. And so I think there just needs to be more conversations and they're starting. Um, but 
absolutely the, the plastic uh, and packaging manufacturers need to be at the table to have some of those conversations. And um, I know that, you know, some of the legislation that that is being looked at, looking at what we call extended producer responsibility. So making sure that if um, a product or packaging is going to be sold, that there is uh, infrastructure for it. And we do this in civil engineering and other practices. If people are going to build a facility, for example, like we have a large above ground storage tank facility in my community, they had to help improve the roads right, right. around that. So the trucks can safely come in and out. So right. in, you know, we, we've applied this in other situations, but not so much in this waste world. And so um, what we're really hoping for in this Mississippi project is to, to bring um, more companies, um, because guess what, the, the cities are on board now, the, the community clearly is, and I hate that even the community has been burdened with this data collection, but instead of thinking it as this burden, think of it as empowering and then getting these conversations started about how to make change. Um, the Alliance, I think this question was related to that because the Alliance is an industry group and it, it crosses, it bridges waste management to consumer goods, um, to uh, plastic and chemical companies. And certainly they are trying to get together on their side to fund uh, projects. And um, I think even more resources and, and more is needed, but that is a start. Thank you. Yeah, that makes good sense to me. In, in, in traveling through different cultures, what major cultural attitudes have you found that affect the plastic waste production? Uh, do they vary across different nations? I'm sure that must be yes. And do you think the current use and throw culture, and now this is a, a political uh, comment, seems to be promoted by capitalism, uh, is playing a significant role in the problem and should there be policies made to address this? So now we're kind of going into the policy element here. Sure. Um, yeah, I think there's been some, and, and, you know, obviously I mentioned that I have had to testify um, or haven't had to, had the opportunity and, and accepted that opportunity to testify to Congress. And that's all public information in terms of what I said. And what I have said there is talking about um, like extended producer responsibility. I think really thinking about um, again, I think there's just this huge tension between how plastic is so useful and you know I touched on this at, at the beginning and why it's so hard to manage in the waste stream and so I think that with that challenge we there and and one of the most successful let's just say recycling systems that I've seen is in Norway so one quick example um, they there is a legislation that says if you're going to sell a drink in a beverage bottle it has to be 98 percent of those have to be recycled 95 i think um and so they actually create this companies so it, it actually spurred economic innovation so several companies that said hey if you want to sell your beverage we'll help make sure we'll record all the data make sure it gets recycled etc so this one company infinitum that said we will do this they said, but if you're going to work with us to do this, you need to design your bottles in a certain way and, you know, and, and then follow sort of all this so that we can actually economically recycle these and they track every single bottle and there's like a 98% recycle rate because there are design standards everyone sort of agrees to the system and then they do a deposit return scheme. Mm. Those are shown to reduce leakage by 40%. So there are lots of policies in place. I think um, getting creative about how getting products to people and not producing packaging. So I don't necessarily, yes, the culture of use and throw away is an issue. I don't necessarily know it's directly capitalism because I think we can, we can meet people's needs and, you know, have livelihoods, you know, met, but are increased, but, um, but we just have to get more creative. I think it's been an easy way out or an easy way, just too easy of a yeah. way to do this. There was a question actually about a national bottle deposit. And I think you said 40% mm -hmm. increase in recycling rate. Is that? No, it's a 40% decrease in what you see on the ground. Oh, I'm okay. Thank you. Yeah. For yes. So, that. Okay, and yeah. that, yep. That was research that was, uh, I, I wasn't a part of that research, but that was research that was published with data in the U.S. Yeah. Um, I'm, so, the, the mm -hmm. plastic bottle when it's disposed still has some value. It can still hold water if you clean you know it, for example really, but but it actually could have real value in terms of a deposit so that makes sense. and what's really interesting is out of those eighty nine thousand items in india we saw less or 500 just barely 500 bottles so mm. the fact that bottles are in like the top five here i just i've never because i haven't done this in the u.s before normally i am traveling around the world 
I'm shocked to see this many beverage bottles because they're so valuable in other places. They get recycled. Right, right. Uh, a lot of questions. So we're going to keep going. <laughs> I'm wondering how much of the plastic pollution is from fishing gear. You mentioned that in your, and I've read some things recently about it holds, uh, it's really the top in plastic waste uh, floating in the, in the Pacific. Is that true? And that consistent with your research? Yeah, so uh, so that was others that was like LeBrayton did some of that work and and they looked in the Pacific and and yes, a lot of what they were seeing there is fishing gear. Um, we saw a lot more on the Ganges than maybe people had thought would be seen. Um, it is a significant source. Unfortunately, there hasn't been a calculation for many years of of what they think is is ending up there, and I think it's it's been challenging. The last estimate was something like 640,000 tons, which is we know is not accurate. We know it's more than that. Um, is it on the same magnitude of what we think is going in from municipal solid waste? Probably, but we don't don't have that exact number. But it is is it is a significant source. And the Global Ghost Gear Initiative is a great group. They collect data and they're doing a lot of work on this issue. So I highly recommend yep. them. They're associated with Ocean Conservancy now. I have I have heard of them. Yes, actually, one mm -hmm. of our colleagues mentioned them. Um, taking the data that you've collected uh, and models to predict plastic waste and its distribution, have you, have you, you, I'm guessing the answer is this is yes, work directly with policymakers and now you advise them on legislation? Is that, so this connection that we've uh, in, in the center always been striving for is to connect the scientists to the policymaker in a more direct yep. way. Can you talk about your experience there? Yeah, it's it's been incredible. To be honest, when when we were first working on that 2015 paper, that was with the NCs, so a center out of UC Santa Barbara, um, and they uh, then worked with Compass. So a, a communication, you know, really Compass's mission is to just help scientists communicate to policymakers or just communicate in general. Um, and then I just had opportunities to meet with legislators, either through the university or through Compass. They just said, people want to hear about this. Um, but to be honest, it, it was also just the type of paper. I mean, the State Department called me after it was published direct, you know, and just said, we want to meet with you. I don't know if this was you know, the fact that there was lists of countries and they were starting to look at this issue. Um, and it just has, has risen to the top as one that um, honestly, it's very bipartisan. And that's been hmm. probably one of the top reasons that people have wanted the science on the issue and wanted to hear from us, um, because it is an issue that at least people agree on they don't want plastic in the environment. The approaches vary. Um, and you can see that with the legislation, you know, that's available. There's a Recycle Act, a Recover Act, a Break Free from Plastic Act, and um, the Save Our Seas Act, which has passed now twice, 1.0 and 2.0. So, um, yeah, so I guess I've just had an amazing experience um, in doing that and seeing your work used in that way. Um, it, yeah, it's very, I guess, rewarding. I'm sure, yes. Yeah. Yes, bipartisan agreement is always a good starting point. Uh, how we get to the end is a, another question. Right. Uh, here's an education one kind of is, is yep. why, why, why do we get, why do people pollute? Have you learned why, why what's going on here? And, and it, that's an infrastructure thing too, but, but educational initiatives play a role uh, too here. So do you have any thoughts or have you given that any thought? Yeah. Um, you know, I don't really know why this was, this was a question I had way back when too, and, and even about recycling. So there's also like, why, you know, cause I would never litter, you know, on purpose. I'm sure something has blown out of my hands though. I mean, you know, it's, you know, that happens. Uh, oh, I know I lost my sunglasses once in the ocean because I wore them in and then a big wave came. I do remember that. Okay, there. don't let anybody know that you've been putting plastic I, in the ocean. All right, <laughs> nobody, everybody don't remember that. But I mean, you know, it, it ha you have to admit, right? I mean, right. it happens. Like, I remember I was, I was very upset, but, um, and probably more that the plastic went in than I lost sunglasses that I had paid for. But um, I think, um, I don't, we, you know, we don't know why I think about that. Is it, you know, the environmental ethic, walking and picking up litter with my mom as a kid in Pine City and still doing that. We just did that two days ago because we <laughs> went down to the Snake River Landing and, um, and we, and I was like, well, let's track. And so, um, you know, I think it's just, we're still asking that question. I don't have the answer to that question, um, but I do think education plays a role. And that's one reason why we partnered now with Debris Tracker as the citizen science tool with Nat Geo Education. So their whole education office, they've developed some curriculum. Um, even on this expedition, I took my kids in, we met with a class. Um, so really trying to, to bring in folks that maybe aren't thinking about this issue. 
but it's hard. I mean, you know, people are thinking about, I, I'm seeing a lot of intersectional issues and around the world. I mean, a lot of people are thinking about where their next meal comes from, how they're going to keep shelter. You know, are, are they going to have a job to go to the next day? This is low on that list, understandably. Sure. And so I think, um, you know, thinking about how this all sort of fits in together, if, if it does. And so that's another thing to take into consideration. Two questions that are related. Um, yep. We know we found the plastic, a missing plastic at the bottom of the ocean. Is there any sense of how, what fraction that is in the ocean, number one? And number two, are there strategies that are um, useful or effective for catching plastic in, in waterways? Rivers was the specific mm -hmm. uh, question yep. here. Maybe yep. you can address those. Sure. So um, yeah, a lot of, I, I think a lot of the missing plastic is at the ocean, you know, we've now gone to new places in the ocean and hey, there's, a, there's plastic there before we even get there. But that was appalling to me when they posted one time and, and there was a bottle on the bottom of the ocean and they're like, we've not been here before. And I'm like, well, our footprint has. Mm -hmm. um, but we don't know. We don't know that, that percentage yet because the ocean being 70% of our planet is hard to quantify that. Um, and so that, that we don't have that number yet. And then the second question, what was the second question? It just escaped my mind. Uh, are there any good strategies for collecting oh, yeah. that, if, either from oceans or rivers or, you know, like strategies for you know, straining Definitely. it? Definitely. And yes. I've heard about people in big uh, 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 vessels going out trying to catch ocean plastic. Does that have any traction? And, and yeah. So, well, first of all, when it gets in the ocean, it's re it is very hard. So again, 70% of our planet, it gets very diffuse. So, you know, I sort of stopped my framework at, you know, entering the ocean, but that last chance for capture um, is critical. And yes, there's Mr. Trash Wheel in Baltimore. If you've seen him, he's got a great Twitter following. Look him up. He's great. But there's also Mr. Professor Trash, Trash Wheel. Wheel. Okay. He's, got, uh -huh. he's got colleagues now all over um, in Baltimore. So they are conveyor belts. There's a boom system and it just is floating on top and, and then conveyor belts pull everything that's floating along the booms into um, a dumpster and then that gets managed. Um, also, we have one across in Athens, across a little river and creek there. Um, that's a Stormex system or Stormex and then, um, oh gosh, I can't remember all the names, but basically a lot of boom systems. And we saw those in Baton Rouge. Now, great system. We saw lots of plastic captured. However, if they're not cleaned out, then they just are like a plug flow. <laughs> they just kind of build up and then there's a rain and then that material can be lost. So all of these things then require more work and more maintenance. And if you think about, if we could just move it further upstream again and manage it there, it's much more efficient. And so as you kind of move down and are managing it, it gets less and less efficient. It gets more efficient, sorry, more diffuse, less efficient in management. So, but those, some of those systems are great because something's always going to get out. Right. Sorry, right. that was a long answer. No, no I understand. One well, when, you, <laughs> when you're tracking, <laughs> I'm going to take the, uh, the uh, organizer's prerogative here and do just a, a couple more questions. So okay. uh, do you, do you, when, we have a, when we have a bottle, of course, tracking that, but a big, a big problem is microplastics, microfibers, and things like that. Um, so uh, microfibers play a big role here. Can you just talk a little bit about your views on microplastics and microfibers? Sure. Yep. That was a big question for a, for a quick ending, but um, and I, you know, I didn't really touch on that at all because I don't, I, I, I tried to do that. I couldn't fit that into my bandwidth of all the analytics. And actually, Jason has done a lot more of that now that you know he's in. We've got our nanosec center and things like that, and they found micronized plastic. They were calling that inside baby sea turtles and. Um, you know, I think it's a huge issue and we don't know the impacts, um, why we were air sampling in India and Bangladesh. It's microfibers are floating in our air. They're ending up in our drinking water, um, both bottled and tap, uh, other food systems, beer, sea, um, seafood, sea salt. And so we, but we don't really know. I mean, they are very small. Do they just pass through us? Are there, are there other things happening? So many people with much more expertise are working on that. Um, but my views are that we don't know we should um, really be proceeding with caution in terms of and, and working to reduce that. Um, washing clothes is another mm -hmm. source of microfiber. Mm -hmm. um, we banned microbeads. That was one of the great, one of the best legislations. You know, we were quick to do that. And many people did a lot of great work to make that happen. I'm going to end with the last uh, question here, and I've been scrolling through them, and there are a lot more questions that we're going to be able to get to, so I apologize to those we didn't get to. Um, but this is going to be 
The question is, I'll read it verbatim, how do you personally manage your plastic waste other than your sunglasses? Uh, and has your research driven you to change your personal relationship with plastic in your daily life? I'll tag on with that another question. And um, I've gotten this question before giving lectures, not unlike this, that said, what should we do? What's the number one thing uh, mm -hmm. that either you do or we should do to help this problem starting now? Right. Okay. So personally, absolutely. I mean, you know, this, I think I was, well, when I entered this space, which was before people were really cared about, it was before 2015, but working to um, just do it one, and I'm going to combine sort of my answers, like what I do and what you can do. It was to reduce slowly and pick one thing at a time. So I've gotten really good about water bottles, barely, barely ever, you know, like if you're out and you've forgotten your bottle, you know, and of course it's fine if you're really thirsty or dehydrated or whatever, it's okay. I mean, if you need to, but all the other times that you did it, that you bring this, it makes a difference. So I think kind of be gentle on yourself. If you're transitioning from using, uh, you know, a disposable or single use bottle every day and switch to that, it's okay. You're going to forget for a while, but then it just becomes like your phone, right? You hardly ever forget your phone or your purse or whatever. It just becomes a part of your daily habits. Um, but it takes time. And it's okay if you forget, again, bag to the grocery store. Um, I have, you know, it's, it's a part, not everybody in my family remembers bags like I do, and we don't all do it the same. But again, every time you can try to use a reusable item, it makes a difference. And I know that does because population driver, it, population is a big driver in our models. Um, and so taken collectively, but it's really hard to make some of those choices. If you want some cookies and you go to the store, they're all in plastic packaging. So I don't, you know, blame people, it's the system also needs to be able to change and actually going plastic free entirely is a luxury that a lot of people don't have the time or expense. It's, ex it's expensive too, in many ways, you have to shop at places that sell bulk goods. Um, it's not easy. And, um, and so I just want to kind of stress that all the burden is not on us communicating to companies, communicating to governments, um, you know, collective action in this in this space is, is going to be important as, and, and how things change. So those are some of the things that both I've personally done and that I think others can do. And of course, immediately right now, if you want to collect data to make that upstream change, head out in St. Paul and do a 30 minute transect. And um, yeah, that will help. Perfect. Yes, that's perfect. Great way to end. Uh, Professor John Beck, thank you so much. What a what a fabulous yeah. lecture, inspirational lecture. We're very happy Great. to have hosted you for the Covester Lecture on Sustainability and all the best to you and your research and travels across the world to address this important issue. Thanks so thank much you to for all the participants. Yes, thank you to all the participants. And we look forward to seeing you sometime in person in the not too distant future. Thank you and bye-bye. Thanks again. Bye-bye.